Stand up to your feet all over the auditorium. Choir, go find your seat out in the house. Joshua chapter number 7 this morning. Joshua chapter number 7. Anybody and everybody still on the altar, you're not bothering me at all. You stay there as long as you need. Joshua chapter number 7 this morning. As we walk into this season of revival, I have been trying to start a new series for three or four weeks. And the Lord hadn't let me start it. I thought I was going to start it today. And then um, the Lord began to deal with my heart about revival this week. And so maybe, maybe next Sunday we'll start it. I don't know. God's in control of all that. Concerning the subject of revival, here's what I believe about it. I believe God wants us to experience real heaven-sent revival more than we want revival. We look at revival sometimes and we think, man, if God would just send it. But I believe heaven is waiting for us to get positioned for it. We think God's withholding it. And it's not that God's withholding it. God is waiting for us to get in the right position to receive it. There are elements of life that hinder us from experiencing the fullness of everything that God has for you and for me. With the help of the Lord, I want to try to deal with some of that with a sincere prayer that all of us this week could get a little bit closer to Jesus and feel the fires of revival burning in our soul again. Look at me, look with me in 2 Kings chapter number 7. Joshua chapter number 7. Uh, Elvis thing still got me tore up. Joshua chapter number 7 and verse number 19. So to catch you up to speed, in the previous chapter, God has sent Joshua and his men to Jericho. How many times did they march around the wall? Somebody talk to me. Oh, y'all are such, y'all are so good Bible students. Seven times the number of Completion. Seven times around the walls of Jericho, and they blew the what? The trumpet. When the trumpet sounded, the walls came tumbling down. Not outwardly, but inwardly, the walls fall down. God told Joshua and his men concerning the victory that God was about to give them about what they were to do with the stuff, the spoils of that battle. And previous in chapter, he said the, 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 the treasure, the gold, the stuff that you find there, he called them the accursed. Don't touch them. Don't take them. They're to go into the Lord's treasury. Do not take of the accursed and in Joshua chapter 6, Joshua chapter 7, there's this man by the name of Achan. While they're going through, and after the battles won, and after the walls came tumbling down, Achan saw some stuff on the inside of Jericho. And he was made out of the same stuff me and you made out of it. Here's probably what he said. Well, I know what God said. And I know what preacher Joshua said. Ain't nobody looking around right now. Can't nobody see me right now. 
Nobody's going to know I take this garment. Nobody's going to know I took this gold. Nobody's going to know I took this silver. And he takes it and goes back to his tent and hides it in the ground under his tent. And God has to expose the sin in the camp for Israel to walk in blessing again. Israel just has a major victory against Jericho. And next chapter, they go to fight a little army named Ai, Ai. And they say, well, we don't need our whole army. We'll just send a portion of our army. And this little army named Ai whoops the Israelites. They go from winning big historical battles to losing little battles because there's sin in the camp. And when sin's in the camp, God's blessing can't flow at the same time. God, Joshua thought something was wrong with him. Joshua goes to God and prays. And God says, get up. You didn't do nothing wrong. I didn't do nothing wrong. Somebody in your camp, Israel has sinned. There's sin in the camp. And so Joshua now has to go and root out the sin in the camp. Look with me in Joshua chapter number 7 and verse number 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered and answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Watch this. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold and 50, shekel of, she of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran into the tent and behold it was hid in his tent and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and unto all the children of Israel and laid them un out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan the son of Zerah and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. Now look. We preach about a God of love and a God of mercy and a God of forgiveness, and I am thankful that He is that. But our pulpits across America have grown silent concerning the side of the wrath of God that we find. in the, God's not playing games with sin. God hates sin. Watch how it's dealt with. And all Israel stoned Him with stones burned them with fire and they had stoned them with and after they had stoned him with stones and they raised over him a great heap of stones unto this day so the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger wherefore the name of that place was called the valley of acre unto this day father in Jesus name I pray Lord that you would help me to deliver your word just as you put it in my heart just as you've wrote it in your word. I pray, Lord, for old time, Holy Ghost convicting power to walk around this room. In my heart, in their hearts, have your perfect will and way here today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said. You can be seated. Becky and I had just got married and in marriage counseling preacher Brown would say stuff like this Angela 
If you can make it through the first year, you're going to be just fine. Anybody ever heard that before? I remember in those days of counseling when he would say stuff like that, thinking, my goodness, what in the world could that blonde-headed, blue-eyed girl do to ever make me mad? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we went through those days, everything's fine. You know, we, I, I was traveling with Preacher Brown. I was working here at the church, and I, I do all this stuff. And he, he and I were pretty close at the time. And one day, I got a phone call. We'd probably been married, what, six months maybe? Uh, I got a phone call to come to Preacher Brown's office. Usually that meant he had a new joke. Uh, something funny happened. Or he was going to tell me where we were going to go the next couple of days and where we were going to drive to. This day, I walk in the office. And he had this little, <clears throat> that little coughing thing he did. <clears throat> Sit down, son. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. I knew something was different because them glasses were not up here. They were right on the bridge of his nose. And I didn't take me long to realize I'm fixing to learn a lesson. Preacher Brown was not really one of those soft-spoken people that really cons was concerned about how you were going to feel about what he had to say. I don't know if y'all know that or not. Brother Mike Brown could probably testify. He quickly, you know, we, we talk about the sandwich approach where when we bring somebody in the office, we talk about the good stuff they're doing, and then we kind of squeeze in the negative, then we put another sandwich over here with some more good stuff because we want everybody to feel good when they leave. <laughs> Preacher Brown, he, he was a carnivore. He didn't eat the bread on the sides. He just ate the meat right in the middle. He went right to it. He said, I've been noticing on Sunday mornings that you and Becky have been coming in late every Sunday. Um, he said, I just want to get this straight. He said, those people that come to church with us, they are faithful to tithe and give. And out of that, we have believed that it's God's will for us to hire you and to pay you a salary every week. And we do not pay you to be late we pay you to be on time. I'm sorry, preacher. I remember panicking on the inside. I thought, am I fixing to get fired? What's going to happen? And man, Preacher Brown just started lightening me. And he, he said, and I know what you're dealing with. I helped raise your wife. She's been late everything she's ever done her whole life. And I know, I didn't say it, he said, I know what you're dealing with. And he put them glasses on his, he said, but you better listen to me, boy. If you want to keep your job here, you better put your big boy britches on and get that stuff under control and get to church on time. Do you understand me? Yes, sir. I said, where do I go get them britches at? Where do I buy them at? Where, where, where can I find them things at? You know, I, I, I'll never forget that day I called Becky. And I'm, I, I, was, I, was, I was trying to be mad, but I was so in love with her. You know, how can I be mad? I remember picking up the phone. I said, hey, honey, we got to have a family meeting. we got to talk. She said, I said, what time are you going to be home? She said, I'm going to be home at this time. Uh, yada, yada, where are we going to eat dinner? I said, oh, we need to sit down and talk. we got to talk about some stuff. Uh, she said, all right, I'll be home at yada, yada time. And I said, I'll be there and I'll be waiting. I'll never forget uh, that, that, that I, maybe it was 5 o'clock. I don't know. But we got off at 4 o'clock here, so that meant I had a little bit of time at the house before she got there and I had to keep my mad going you know what I mean like I, I was walking through that house saying you got to stay aggravated put them big boy britches on boy you got to fix this thing or you're going to lose your job and if you lose your job every dream you got of ministry is going to be shattered and I, I'm walking through that house I remember reminding myself don't look her in the eyes when she comes in don't look her in the eyes when she comes in she got them Medusa eyes if you look her in the eyes she'll put you in a trance you know I mean don't look in them eyes boy don't look in them eyes I remember why I'm, I'm pacing through that little double wide over there by the camp meeting grounds and I remember the door come open and she said honey I'm home I'm 
He said, don't look her in the eyes. Don't look her in the eyes. I said, I said we need to talk. Please come in here. And I'm doing like this. I won't look at her. She said, what's wrong? And I, I tried to stay away from her, Dale, but she come right in there and give me a big old hug. Put a big old smooch on me. Amen. <laughs> and I'm still trying not to look at her. I'm, sp- I'm trying not to look her in the eyes because I know what will happen. And I, I, she kissed me real good. She said, now what did you need to talk about? I said, nothing. <laughs> she said, no, I can tell it on your voice. What's wrong? I said, baby, Preacher Brown called me in the office today and he was mad that we've been late for church. She said, did you throw me under the bus? I said, no, ma'am, no, ma'am. I, no, I did not throw you under the bus. I did not. But he did say that he knew that you, you was late sometimes. And, and he told me that I had to fix it or I was going to lose my job. She said, baby, I'm so sorry. She said, I promise you this Sunday. Do you remember saying this, Becky? Shake I'm not, I'm not telling something that ain't true. I promise you this Sunday, I'll be up early and on time. I said, That's what I thought you'd say. Hey, Amen. These pants is working. These things are going good, you know. <laughs> I'm going to go buy me another pair of these big boy britches, you know. I, I thought, man, that went better than I thought it would. The week goes by. We went on a date. We went eight Saturday night. We had everything. Everything was going great. I, 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 I said, honey, don't forget our agreement. We got to wake up a little bit early and we got to be ready on time for church. Oh, I've already picked out my outfit. I got everything ready. Everything's good. But how many of y'all know y'all can like an outfit on Saturday night? Huh? Yeah, yeah, I'm coming after you. You can like an outfit on Saturday night. You can, come on, men, don't die on me now. You can try it on on Saturday night, and it'll be flowing the way you want it to flow, looking the way you want it to look, but something happens in the middle of the night where it just don't look the way you want it to look on Sunday morning. Mm-hmm. And uh, Becky gets up, and construction begins. Makeup, that hair don't get like that instantaneous. It is a process. She does a little makeup stuff first and doing all this stuff. And then back in them days, she had that hair. To... You had to build something underneath that hair to get that hair to do that. She, I, I could almost tell you, she'd pull it down, she'd get the little comb. Build that stuff up like a big old nest and this. <laughs> and without moving her upper body, she would lean down and grab that gallon jug of hairspray. <laughs> Spraying that hairspray everywhere. Everything's going perfect. And I start noticing. We got 20 minutes. And I start sweating. Oh Lord, I'm going to lose my job. If we don't get there, I'm going to lose my job. And the words of my man of God kept echoing through my mind. Put your big boy britches on, boy. So I went back in my closet and put my big boy britches back on. I have learned since then to not say some things. I walked into that room realizing we're going to be late. And I said, woman. I wish I wouldn't have never said that. I don't know if it was the way I said it or the how I don't know, but it didn't go the way I wanted it to go. And I remember little sweet Becky laid her little gallon jug of hairspray down and said, Don't rush me. <laughs> to whence I, do you not remember the conversation? Preacher Brown's gonna fire. And I mean, to that point, me and Becky had never had so much as an argument. But boy, on that morning, boom! I don't even 
even remember everything that God said in that house. And don't y'all look at me spiritual like y'all ain't never had this happen at your house on Sunday morning. The carpet's still the same color. Quit looking at the carpet and look up at the preacher. Quit acting super spiritual. Don't act like you ain't never done this before either. Yeah. Huh. It blew up at my house. We got in the car. We were living on Hidden Hills at the time. We flew down the road, pulled in the car parking lot. We ain't said nothing to each other. We both got 15 demons walking with us every step we're taking. We come to the church and walk on that little parking lot side over there, and there's something about Baptist people. Mad as the devil at each other in the car, but as soon as we get out of the car, oh, hey, y'all. How you, uh, Becky was working it that day. I almost wore that same dress, girl. That looks so good. I'm over, hey, man, praise God. Isn't God good? Praise God. Good to have you in church. The Lord, praise Father, Son, Holy Ghost. He's good. He's wonderful. Good to walk with him this morning. Yeah. It was a mess. We walked in. Got in that very choir. Uh, the girls sat in the middle at the time. I sat right over there on that first seat. Becky sat over there near her mama. And I'll never forget Preacher Brown looking at me and looking at his watch. And I was, it was two till, and now we was in our place, and he went. <laughs> I went. My big boy britches worked. He got up there. He said, I, I, I feel like we ought to do something a little bit different today. I want Becky and CT to come sing a song for us. <laughs> Look here. I remember walking down that side. Becky comes out. And we stood right here. And there was a sheet of ice on this stage that could not be broken. I remember in that moment feeling the conviction of the Holy Ghost that I'm about to sing dirty. I'm about to give a sacrifice to God that's not clean. Y'all listen to me. And I remember that feeling of the conviction of the Holy Ghost to which I said, Lord, thou heardest it all. You know that wasn't my fault. That was her fault. Go talk to her, Lord. That's not the way it works. And in that moment, the Holy Ghost broke my heart. And I'll never forget leaning over while Preacher Brown's praying. And I said, baby, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said what I said. I shouldn't have acted the way I acted. Please forgive me. To which she started bawling, crying, I'm sorry, I really did try. And before church, we're already having an altar call right here on the stage. Isaac, I'll never forget, your mama was sitting on the front row. And I remember Becky started singing that song and the Holy Ghost started moving. I remember... Isaac's mama getting up and coming to the altar who was battling cancer at the time and God moved. And I'll never forget that day, the Holy Ghost dealing with my heart. Don't ever forget what I can do when you get clean. Making things right with each other and making things right with God. But here's what I know. If we hadn't made things right, the Holy Ghost could not have blessed it. Because there was sin in the middle of the camp. God, I, I hear some of you thinking, well, arguing with your wife is not a big sin. Well, I, God is interested in how you treat your spouse. God is interested about how we talk to our kids. The Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me 
So with that in mind, I want us to look at Joshua 7 today. and I'm going to preach on sin's secret burden. Sin's secret burden. Moving quickly today. Cameron, throw me that water if you don't mind, please. Number one, secret sin is deceptive. Secret sin is deceptive. Uh, when Achan confessed his sin in chapter number 7, uh, he said, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus and thus. He said, when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment, and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight. Watch this now. First of all, he saw it. Look here now. He said, then I coveted them. Thirdly, and took them. And behold, they are, here's fourth, they are hid in the earth. So he saw it. He coveted it. He took it. And then he tries to hide it. That is the progress of sin every single time. We see it. We covet it. We take it. And then we realize, oh no, what have I done? I now have to hide. Three things he took. He took a goodly Babylonian garment. Literally, is a, it was a, when I studied it, it is a mantle, of, a mantle of Shinar. The plain of Shinar was in early times celebrated for its gorgeous robes, which were of brilliant and various colors. Uh, he took a goodlyish Babylonian garment. He took 200 shekels of silver. Uh, that would have been about $200 according to the old, old mosaic shekel or the half of that sum reckoning by the common shekel. Or, and then thirdly, he took a wedge of gold that they say in commentaries that could have been worth about $500. None of these things at appearance are bad things. It says a goodly Babylonian garment. 200 shekels of silver. A wedge of gold. In, in themselves, in a, they, they are not bad things. But when God says don't touch them, and you touch what God says not to touch, the Bible says it this way, for him that knoweth to do right and doeth it not to him, it is A, look at this. A goodly Babylonian garment. I thought, Holy Ghost, why would you put that word goodly in there? There's nothing wrong with a garment. Pretty clothes. There's nothing wrong with that. Here's something I wrote down. A good thing can be a bad thing when it keeps us from the best things. A good thing can be a bad thing when it keeps us from the best thing. Sin will rob you of the best. You hear me? Yes, He's a God of mercy. Yes, He's a God of grace. Yes, He's a God of forgiveness. But don't be mistaken. Sin will rob you of the best. Secret sin is deceptive. It is the same voice that we deal with. That tells us nobody's ever going to know. Can I just be real today? Y'all can act churchy. This is a sermon that all of us are going to deal with this week. On some level. Secret sin will tell you nobody's going to find out. You're smarter than other people are who have got caught at this. It's not going to bother you like it would bother other people. Sin is so deceptive. 
It will wrap you up like a snake where you feel like you got a friend, but before you know it, it will constrict on you and grab a hold of you and not let you go. Go find you a person in this room that's addicted to pornography. And at one time, it was just something they did every now and then. But now it has such a grip on them they have absolutely no control at times. My grandfather died a complete alcoholic. Many of my family did the same. And you go find people that thought, well, I can play with this. I can do this. I'm stronger than other people. But for many people, the same hand that picked up that first bottle, they don't have the ability to set it back down. My grandfather lost his career. Lost his family. Died walking the streets of Charleston, West Virginia because he could not put that poison down. Go find somebody that thought, I'm just going to have fun as a college student. I'm going I'm to do a little bit of drugs so I can feel good in the moment. And one drug leads to another drug. Until the, the deceptiveness of sin completely grabs a hold of them. And many die an early grave because sin is so deceptive. We not only see that secret sin is deceptive, but we see that number two, secret sin has or carries consequences. You can choose your sin. Everybody say that. You can choose your sin. But listen to me. You don't get to choose your consequences. You can choose your sin, but you don't get to choose your consequences. Secret sin carries consequences. Be not deceived. It's going to get quiet this morning. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. God's not mocked. Look at the preacher right in the eyeballs. You ain't getting away with nothing. You think you've got everybody fooled. You've got the wool over everybody's eyes. You're smarter. You've got everything covered. You, you just like we were when we were kids and mama would say, go sweep the kitchen floor and you're too lazy to go get the thing over there and put the stuff and you just lifted up the rug and you just swept it under the rug and you thought, well, ain't nobody ever going to find out. But, but God has a really good way. At just the moment you think nobody knows, he said, hey, let's talk about this right here. We have choices concerning our sin. You can confess it and forsake it, and the blood of Jesus will cover it. Amen. Or you can cover it, try to at least, and God will uncover it. Secret sin carries Consequences. We see the command. He said, don't touch it. Don't take of the accursed thing. Uh, that, that, that's to go in the Lord's treasury. That, that, that's the command. Don't touch it. It becomes the accursed things in your hand. And then i got to point out on this, that not only the command, but the covenant. When Achan took of the accursed thing, it not only affected him, it affected the entirety of Israel. Because God was operating in covenant with His people. In Numbers chapter number 32 and verse 20, here's what Moses said unto them. If ye will, watch this, I will if you will. Watch this covenant. And Moses said unto them, if ye will do this thing, if ye will go armed before the Lord to war, and will go all of you armed over Jordan before the Lord, until he hath driven out his enemies from before him, and the land be subdued before the Lord, then afterward ye shall return and be guiltless before the Lord and before Israel. And this land shall be your possession before the Lord. Do you see that? 
God's saying, if you'll do this, if ye will, if ye will, if ye will, then this land shall be your possession before the Lord. There's the command, the covenant, and the reward thereof. Watch how he finishes it though. But if ye will not do so, behold, ye have sinned against the Lord. And watch this. And be sure your sin will find you out. Now, we either judge ourselves or God will judge us. Through the blood of Jesus, God has given us the availability or the ability to pray and say, God, search me. See if there's any wicked way in me for us to judge ourselves. I did, I did, this morning before I preached, I said, Lord, I don't, I don't want to preach this sermon and not practice. Lord, reveal to me areas of my life where I'm missing the mark. Lord, reveal areas of my life where I've transgressed against what your best way is for my life. And you know what I found out? The Holy Ghost said, let's talk about this. Let's talk about I was like, Lord, i got to go preach. You're going to, be, you're going to be easy on me. To be continued, Lord. Because all of us got a big rug in our life that we love to cover stuff with. Our sin, our consequences, once we've been saved by the grace of God, we believe it does not change or alter our relationship, but it sure does change our Fellowship. I love going to church. Man, I mean, I could do every day of my life. I enjoy when the choir gets us singing, when we start worshiping. There's few things in this world I enjoy any more than the presence of God in worshiping. When your heart's clean, your conscience is pure, and you're right before the Lord. And you can raise your hands and testify to the goodness of God. But then I've also walked into church and sat on a pew with my heart dirty. I can't feel nothing. I can't sense nothing. I try to pray and I feel like I'm talking to the ceiling. Does that mean God's not good? Does that mean God's not real? No, it just means that I have unconfessed sin in my life that is putting a wall, a block between me and God. One of the greatest consequences of the people of Israel in this text was the removal of the presence of God. They went from winning big battles against Jericho to now they got this little tiny army named Ai and they go and they think, we don't even have to send the whole army. We'll send part of them. And they go in confidence thinking they're going to win that battle and they lose the battle because they did not have the power of the presence of God working in their favor. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you we need to prioritize the presence of God in our life more than anything, more than wealth, more than fame. Your business needs the, the presence of God. Your marriage needs the presence of God. Your teenagers need the presence of God. There are battles that you and I can win because we are operating in sync with the presence of God. But when we step out and say, I'm going to live in sin and harbor unconfessed sin in my life the things that you used to win the big battles over now you'll start losing the little battles you'll be defeated you're going to lose your joy you're going to lose your shout you're going to lose your happiness you're going to lose your peace you're going to be mad at everybody all the time everybody else is going to be the problem everybody else is going to have issues you're going to go to 15,000 different churches and think 15,000 churches are doing it all wrong and if they were all as smart as you were 
her. Then they finally get the church right. When in reality, it's not the churches that are wrong. It's not your family that's wrong. It's not the people that are wrong. Somewhere along the line, you've allowed sin to harbor itself like a parasite on the inside of your heart. And it has stolen your joy. It's stolen your shout. It's stolen your smile. And somewhere along the line, you've got to quit blaming everybody else. You've got to quit playing the victim card and realize maybe, just maybe, it's not my dad's fault. Maybe, just maybe, it's not my mom's fault. Maybe, just maybe, it's not my principal's fault. Y'all get quiet on me if you want, but I'm going to preach it in this weak liberal day of everybody playing the victim card, blaming all of your consequences on somebody else. Maybe, just maybe, you ought to look in the mirror and say, maybe, just maybe, this is not an attack against me, but this is a consequence of my sin. God, help us to see that God's not angry and God's got mad, but God cannot bless us when there's unconfessed sin living and dwelling in our heart. I told the Lord last night, Lord, this is not the best sermon for Pastor Appreciation Day. Everybody's going to be mad leaving church today. But more than I'm concerned about Pastor Appreciation, I'm, I'm concerned about us experiencing revival this week. And here's what I know we can't experience revival dirty. Mama used to have one of them Charlie Brown Christmas trees. And every year after Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving, after Thanksgiving, we would put that Chris. after Thanksgiving, we would put, y'all who y'all with me? After Thanksgiving, we would put that Christmas tree up. And every year we'd plug that thing in and not nary a light would come on. You know why? One bulb would have a short in it and it would shut the whole tree down. Let me tell you all what I know about the presence of God. We can want revival. We can pray for revival. And here comes the Holy Ghost. And He's starting to move through the body. He wants to move through the body. But up. Somebody grieves Him. Y'all know why Baptist Church has got a bunch of different sections in them? Because there's some people that sit over here because they don't want to sit by somebody that sits over here. Because of something that happened 72 years ago. <laughs> before they were ever even alive. And they believe they have the righteous ability to continue to hate somebody in Jesus' name. That grieves the Holy Ghost. Somebody's gossiping about somebody else. And you think, well, my gossip is holy gossip. My gossip is done from a place of righteousness. I'm holy and I'm doing the Lord a favor by letting everybody else know how wicked that person is. Look in here. God don't need your help. God don't need your help. God can deal with people by himself. He don't need your help to do it. Keep your mouth shut on other people. Y'all hear me? Keep your mouth shut on other people before God deals with you. God never called you to be the instigator or the investigator of the lives of other people. Well, if Pastor C.T. knew what they put on Facebook last week, he wouldn't let them get up there and sing. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Pastor C.T. knew this, I bet they wouldn't be doing this and that. Mind your own business. And, 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 and won't you start worrying about your own sin? And won't you confess your own sin and get right with God before you think you're so holy you have the ability to not only take care of your sin but the sins of other people as well. You are a busybody. Three B's. Baptist busybodies. That's why it's what... So busy. I'm talking about everybody else, everything else going on. And it grieves the Holy Ghost. Hinders the Holy Ghost from working. How many churches have been destroyed by a gossiping tongue? How many churches have been destroyed by a lying tongue? How many churches have been destroyed by a jealous tongue? Sin 
Secret sin has consequences. God's not mocked. Be sure your sin will find you out. Achan took that gold and that garment, brought it back to his tent and thought, ain't nobody ever going to know about this. The blessing of God leaves. They lose the battle. God tells Joshua they're sin in the camp. Joshua goes digging it out. Says, Achan, tell me what you've done. And Achan now must confess his sin. Secret sin, number three, can be defeated and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. Watch this. This is a harsh Old Testament story. Achan sins. The whole nation of Israel is punished because of his sin. We would like to see a little slap on the wrist or a little do better talk. No, not in the law. They take Achan, all his stuff. They stone him to death, burn him and bury him as a picture in the Old Testament of what must happen to sin. It must be eradicated completely from the camp for the blessing of God to flow. I wonder how many of us would live better if those were the consequences today. But we should all jump up and down and shout that we're not living in the dispensation of the law. But the book of Hebrews says we have a better covenant living in the dispensation of grace watch this let me, let me teach Achan was of the tribe of Judah and when Achan sinned in that battle against Ai 36 men die because of his sin Achan's family suffers because of his sin. Your sin does not just affect you. It affects everybody around you. Achan of the tribe of Judah. Because of his sin. 36 people die. But years later. Here comes somebody else. Of the tribe of Judah. That understands mankind. Doesn't have the ability to fix this on their own. And so a man named Jesus from the tribe of Judah comes and dies on the cross for you and for me. Sin, the wages of sin is all of us because of our sin deserve to die the same way Achan did. But God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Matter of fact, 2,000 years ago, before we were ever born or even thought of, but on the cross, Jesus saw down through time and eternity, and He saw a bunch of people in the CSRA that He knew would die because of their sin and could not stand the judgment and the weight of their consequences. And on Calvary, it was not just a little religious experiment that He did, but upon Calvary, the wrath of God was placed upon Jesus the weight of the sin of all mankind of every deed every bad thought everything that would be done was placed upon him John saw him in the Jordan River and said behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world and upon Calvary he was not a sissy Jesus he was not a weak Jesus he was a manly Jesus that bore the weight of the sin of the whole wide world carried our sin up on that cross and every drop of blood that he shed he shed for you and for me so that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might shall be saved. I'm thankful today that yes, we are sinners. And even after I got saved, I can't tell you I've been perfect. I haven't been perfect this week. You haven't been perfect this week. But I am so glad, ladies and gentlemen, that when we mess up and when we falter and when we fail and when we sin, that they're not going to stone us to death on the outside of the camp. But we have an advocate with God the Father through Jesus Christ His Son where we can go and say, Lord, Lord, it's me again. Lord, I've dropped the ball again. I messed up again. And there has already been a payment for my sin and for your sin. Is anybody glad that there's been a payment made for your sin? Vicarious, substitutionary death for your sin. 
The payment has already been made. She's coming to play and I'm done. Here's how it works. If you're saved, if you're saved, the Holy Spirit will convict you of sin. Don't come in here trying to convince me you're saved and going to heaven when you can live any old way you want to live and never face any kind of contradiction or conviction in your heart whatsoever. Get quiet on me if you want, but it's the truth. If you can sin and play that game with the world and there's never conviction or chastisement in your life, you are not a Christian. You are religious at best. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. And if you can still hear that voice, you ought to thank God that you still hear that voice saying, no, no, no. Don't go that way, go this way. That, that ain't right. Those aren't the right people to hang around. We, the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Here comes our part. We confess our sin. 1 John 1 9. If we, here's another covenant, if, 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 if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that wonderful? Lord, it's me again. I'm sorry. I messed up. We confess our sins. We agree with God when we confess. Lord, I'm agreeing with you that that is sin. This is not, I'm going to tell God I'm sorry so I won't feel guilty and then I'm going to go do the same thing all over again. That's not repentance. You're playing games is what you're doing. Confession and repentance is, Lord, I feel terrible that that happened. Please forgive me. And I'm going to turn my back, I'm going to forsake it, and I'm going to walk away from it. That is repentance. We confess our sins, and then He forgives our sins. The judgment and the penalty is removed. And guess what? I got my happy back. I got my joy back. I got my peace back. Because the blood of Jesus... The same blood that saved us has the same power to forgive us. The blood that gives me power from day to day, it will never lose its power. Here's my heart-searching question for you to think about for the next little bit. What is it in your life that you know is not pleasing to Jesus? but you have allowed the voice of conviction has dwindled back because you have just ignored him so many times but you still know it's wrong and that has robbed you of your joy and peace of your Christian walk whatever that is look at this attack it get it gone repent of it forsake it Avoid it. Build walls of transparency and accountability around it so that you don't ever go back and get your joy back. And then you can come to Revival tonight and Monday and Tuesday and God will speak to your heart. You'll open up that Bible and it'll be like 3D. God will speak to you from that Word. When the preacher's preaching, them wheels will spin on the inside of your heart again like they haven't started in years. Or do you want to just keep going through the motions and be miserable? You can have freedom today. You can have joy today if you're willing to confess and forsake. Let God deal. Let God cover. And you walk in freedom. If you believe that's the Word of God, give God a hand clap of praise. I know most people try to run out of church on a Sunday. But please, on this Revival Sunday, we backed up time just a little bit so we can... I wonder 
how many people, as we stand to our feet all over church, I wonder how many people would get out of your seat and find a place on this altar or in your pew and say, God, search me. Lord, I've been, I've been, I've been losing little battles and I've been blaming everybody else, but Lord, I, I need you to search me and reveal to me any areas of my life that's not pleasing unto you. Please forgive me. He'll forgive you today. I need you God, I want to be clean. I want to be right. Lord, all I, have I need my joy back. I need my peace back. Lord, I'll serve you until my dying day. Gonna help us. Help us by.